You can give them a hand. That's right. Wow. Love is sharing a keyboard. Amen. And uh, boy, that's great. You get, to, you get to see some of that stuff from this angle up here. But boy, I tell you what, that was something else. And changing feet on the pedals and all that stuff. And they're, uh, they're going after it. You know, I was thinking when we were singing tonight, it's, uh, it's sad to me that we have a generation of Christians that are growing up and they'll never sing, It Is Well With My Soul our wonderful grace of Jesus, or it's just like his great love. They, they won't know those songs. That's sad to me. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, and I got to thinking, and you've heard me say this before, and I think Brother Booth, he's been, grew up in a preacher's home, singing these songs all his life. He's 103, and uh, he's been singing them all his life. He looks good for 103, doesn't he? And uh, uh, Brother Fennel, how long have you been saved? Okay, you've been singing these songs a long time as well. And you know what? I still get a blessing singing these songs. Uh, they just don't get old to me. Uh, I had, uh, we had an occasion a couple years ago talking with someone about a funeral, and we said, let's, let's sing What a Day That'll Be. I always like to sing that at a funeral. And they said, oh, nobody sings that anymore. I thought, I guess I'm a nobody. Because... <laughs> We still sing it, you know, and uh, still get blessed by it, and uh, it never gets old, never gets old. Neither does the preaching of God's Word, amen? <clears throat> We've enjoyed uh, Brother Booth and the preaching this week, and uh, I think Miss Taylor, you're going to sing. Why don't you come? She's going to sing for us. You'll listen carefully to the special. Ask God to speak to your heart, and to prepare your heart. Make it ready to receive the truth from God's Word tonight from Brother Booth, all right? Miss Taylor. Neath the sods of mirth and glee, God has set eternity in the soul of sin sick man. Somber thoughts of destiny rule these hearts that could be free. We must reach them while we can. We must tell the lost of Jesus' blood has paid sin's penalty. Tell the grace that Christ brought down to man. We must reach them while we can. We must reach them while we can. Midst the city's busy day, or in rustic scenes of play, see the heart of lonely man. Haunting doubts of misty gray make them stumble on their way. We must reach them while we can. We must tell the lost of Calvary. Jesus' blood has paid sin's penalty. Tell the grace that Christ brought down to man. We must reach them while we can. We must reach them while we can. Praise the Lord. been a wonderful week, and I have just thoroughly enjoyed my time here, and, and uh, I want to say again thank you to the church. I want to say thank you to pastor. Um, I know as a preacher it takes leadership, it takes planning, 
uh, takes encouragement to people to work and and uh, all the things that take place don't just happen out of the sky. It just it takes effort, and I appreciate your pastor's leadership and, and thoughtfulness and planning for uh, the missions conference. I appreciate Brother Bob, all of his work. It's been amazing. I, I feel bad he's losing his voice. He shouldn't be hollering at his wife when he's been working so hard. And, uh, but, uh, man, I tell you, wonderful, wonderful meal this afternoon. I really, I, I did a little bit too much, but I enjoyed it, and, uh, and then got a, a good, good uh, time this afternoon studying my eyelids, some of you catch on to that, and uh, I was preaching for one fella in, in Louisiana, and, and he was like most pastors, he was a smart aleck, and uh, it helps, it helps in the ministry, and uh, I said to him, I said, brother, I, I got to get back to get my beauty rest this afternoon. He said, brother, you don't have time for that. You got to preach tonight. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, praise the Lord. I, I enjoy being around God's people. Amen. And I, I love missionaries. I appreciate the good job these missionaries have done this week. And I've just in, enjoyed every aspect of it. And uh, I want to say, I didn't mention this morning, but... Uh, I had had uh, this suit dry cleaned when it came back. The cuff had come out of the one uh, part of it. So I asked pastor, I said, do you by chance have anybody in the church could sew that cuff up? And, and I don't know who did this, but one of you ladies sewed that up, and I appreciate that very, very much. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, just all of the nice things. And, and I know some of you were kind of hoping I was going to wear that one tie. And I'm sorry, I was looking for it. I, I, I couldn't find it. And, you know, I. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh. It's, well, I, I don't know how that got in there, preacher. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cause any grief tonight. Uh, I'm in trouble. I haven't got my love offering yet. I'm in big, big trouble. But I couldn't resist the opportunity. Uh, amen. Well, for our final service, I, I'm not going to be lengthy tonight. Famous last words of an evangelist. Huh? But uh, just want us to once again kind of recap uh, what this has been all about and uh, the great privilege we have to be part of missions. It is one of the great joys of the Christian life. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't quite rank up there with getting saved, but it's real close. And, uh, you know, it's amazing to me as I've had opportunity and privilege, and it seems like the Lord's opened more doors uh, for me to preach more missions conferences, but uh, one of the thrills to me is uh, just meeting missionaries. And they're some of the happiest people you ever met in your life. And the reason is because they're not holding anything back on God. They're just, okay, Lord. And that brings the greatest joy for a Christian. And uh, so I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let's go to the Bible tonight in Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to look at several scriptures in the beginning here and kind of lay the groundwork and I'll share some thoughts with you. Revelation chapter 5. If you know a little bit about the book of Revelation, we know that in chapter 4 is that passage where we see the rapture of the church. Now, I still believe in the rapture of the church is going to happen before the tribulation period, though there's a lot of brethren that have known that for years and are now confused. I don't quite get it, but, uh, but anyway, so, so now we come to chapter 5. In verse 1 it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. 
And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. Say, hey, there's only one worthy. There's only one worthy. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, notice this, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many, ange uh, of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard, or heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. There's going to be the time in heaven where we gather around. There's only one worthy to receive the honor and glory. And the truth is, all of this about missions is for him, the one who's worthy. And the scripture says, as we're gathered around, those four and twenty elders are going to open up those vials that have contained the crying out of the saints. And they're going to cry out honor and glory. And they're going to sing a new song to the Lord. And we're going to fall down and worship Him. Worthy is the Lamb. You see, it says we're going to see Him as the Lamb that was slain. Do you understand when we get to heaven? The most glorious things about, thing about heaven is not going to be the pearly gates. It's not going to be the marvelous streets of gold. It's not even going to be your mansion. The most marvelous thing about heaven is going to be the Lamb that was slain for you and I and redeemed us unto God. We'll see the wounds in His hands to remind us forever that He purchased our redemption. And they're going to fall down and worship and they're going to cry out and it says it'll come from every kindred. And every tongue and every people and every nation. It's going to be the great gift to the Lamb that was slain. That He'll be honored and worshipped and will cry out, You're worthy to receive honor and power and glory. For you have redeemed us and reconciled us to God. It says a new song will be sung just for Him. And it will be sung in all of the representation of those from every kindred, every tongue, every people, and every nation. How are all those people going to get there? Except that we have the privilege to get missionaries across the world. To give the gospel to every kindred, every nation, every tongue. Look over at Psalm 40. And verse 2.
He says, and he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and shall trust in the Lord. A new song. Thank God for the Christian, we've got a new song to sing. Old worldly trashy songs don't mean much to us anymore when we've given our heart to Jesus. There's that new song, and we'll be singing throughout eternity, so you might as well get used to singing, amen? amen. All of us there will be able to sing specials, amen. Look at Luke chapter 15. We have the story given about the lost sheep. And that shepherd that left the ninety and nine to go find the one lost sheep. And when he found that one lost sheep, and it's a great passage because we see what brings great joy to our Lord. When they found the one lost sheep, he brought him back. And there was great rejoicing. And, and, and then it tells us in the next uh, 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 story about the woman who lost the coin and swept the whole house and found the one lost coin. And there was great rejoicing. And it tells us about that lost son, that prodigal son. That when he came home, the father threw his arms around him and there was a party made. They had great rejoicing. Notice in verse 7, I shall say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Look at verse 10. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. I don't know that all these statistics are all perfectly correct. I've, I, I got them from reading an article. But the article I read said the northern part of Yemen has 8 million people and about 20 to 30 Christians out of all 8 million. I read it said there were over 6,000 people groups with over 2 billion people considered unreached by Christianity. I met a man in Iowa who is a engineer, he's brilliant mind, he developed a water purification system that is able to just take water out of the air and purify it and give clean water and, and uh, he's a committed faithful Christian and a soul winner and he got such a burden he started going into some of the remote areas in the world to try to help them and and he was telling me in South Sudan that, that he made a very, met a very high-ranking general. And of course, when he does this, he gives out the gospel. He tries to win souls there, and God's used him and blessed him. But this high-ranking general in South Sudan said, Our nation claims to be Christian, opposite of northern Sudan. He said, but 70% of my people don't even know who Jesus Christ really is. You ever thought about why you were so blessed? I've shared here before the time that I would got on an airplane and I was flying to preach at a missions conference and, and uh, I was flying into Chicago and as the Lord would design it, I sit next to a young man in his early 20s, a sharp young man, and, and uh, we get up in the air and I, I introduce myself to him and I he said, well, my name is Bud. And I said, well, Bud, it's good to meet you. I said, uh, uh, are you going to vi visit some uh, relatives there in, in Chicago? He said, oh, oh, no, sir. He said, I, I don't have any relatives in Chicago. Uh, I said, well, you, you, you're going for work? He said, no, no, sir. He said, I'm actually part of an exchange program with the university. And, and I, I've been in, in Mexico for a while. I've been to some different universities. And and uh, I've just got a little bit of a break, and some folks that I had met, I'm going to, to visit there in, uh, in Chicago. And I said, well, where are you from? He said, Holland. I said, well, I, I know where Holland, Michigan is. I said, my wife grew up in Michigan. He said, oh, no, no, sir. He said, I'm not talking about Michigan. I'm talking about Holland. I said, oh, the country of Holland. He said, yes. I'm thinking to myself, isn't that amazing? I'm, I'm going to a missions conference, and the Lord sits me by a young man from Holland. And so I began to talk to him. I said, well, Bud, I said, you go to church any when you were growing up in Holland? He started laughing. 
It wasn't out of, out of mockery or being disrespectful. He just said, sir, he said, I've never known anybody my whole life in Holland that went to church. I said, well, well, do you know of a church there? He said, well, I've heard rumor that there's a little tiny place where just a, a handful of old, old people gather once in a while. I guess they call it church. I said, but have you ever... Have, have you ever read the Bible or seen the Bible? He said, no, sir, I really haven't. I said, well, if you... I said, bud, do you believe in God? He said, well, he said, you know, I, I guess, sir, that if I had trouble and I was kind of in a real difficult situation, I probably wouldn't even think about calling on God, so I guess I don't believe in God. And I said, well, obviously, you're a very intelligent young man. I said, I could tell that you're very articulate and... I said, I appreciate you talking with me, but I said, Bud, surely you're smart enough to know that even, even if you look at the design of a tree and how it gets its, its, uh, its roots down and gets its nutrition and its nutrition, you can see uh, that there is a designed system. And I said, obviously you understand that there had to be some intellectual design to that. Surely you don't believe it just exploded into existence and ended up that way. And he just looked at me and kind of just looked at me. And I began to just tell him the best I could that there was a God that loved him. And that God not only loved us, but because we've sinned against that God, he sent his own son to die for us. And, and he listened. He didn't grasp at all, but he listened. Before I got off of the plane, he said to me, Well, sir, who knows, maybe someday you'll go to Holland and start a church. And when I left there, I thought to myself, I could have grown up in Holland. You could have grown up in Holland. Never seen a Bible, never heard of a church, never known anybody that went to church. And I thought to myself, dear God, you've been so good to me, I grew up in a preacher's home. I've seen the Bible around all my life. I've heard preaching from the, the first time when I was four days old. I've been around it and... Here I got the privilege to grow up in America. And let me tell you something, folks. To whom much is given, much shall be required. We've been so blessed. Why has God allowed you and me the privilege to grow up in America where we could hear the Word of God faithfully preached and have a Bible of our own? And We've been so incredibly blessed. Apostle Paul, he made reference. He said, I'm a debtor. Both the Jews and the Greeks, Paul never got over the fact that the God's grace that saved him on the Damascus Road that day. Paul realized, man, I was so undeserving. He oftentimes referred to himself as the chief of sinners. He said, I feel a great debt. And I want you to know that every one of us have a debt. We have a debt to those who not only reached us with the gospel, but we more of, so we have a debt to the one who bought our redemption for us. It tells us one day in heaven there will be that time that there will be song and praise and it will come from every kindred and every tongue. And you and I get to have the privilege to invest in those who take the gospel across the world. I want to share a few quick thoughts with you. I want you to understand for that to happen I would like one day to be part of that gift that's given to my Lord where he's exalted and he's honored by all of those tongues and people. But you see, I want you to understand, it cost God the Father something. It cost him something. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It cost him something. You understand that God has, has heart, that God loves. The Bible tells us He's loved. You and I love our children. I can't relate even. I can't even wrap my mind around it. But God loves deeper and more perfect than I love. And He allowed His Son to go to Calvary and to suffer shame and, and, and ridicule and mockery and the spitting beside all of the suffering physically that He went through. And then He took upon Him the sin of every one of us. And God the Father who's perfect and pure and holy allowed His Son to 
to go through that agony so you and I could be forgiven and saved. It cost him something. I read that illustration in the Old Testament about Abraham offering up Isaac, and we know that's a type of our God the Father offering up his son. And Abraham, it says in Hebrew, believe, in Hebrews, he believed that, that his son would be raised from the dead. As our Lord and Savior was raised from the dead, but I can't even comprehend. Abraham willingly laid his son on the altar, was ready to take his life. And an amazing thing about that, you never find that Isaac ever, ever fought his dad about it. Now Isaac wasn't a little boy. He has grown up. But he never fought dad, he never argued with him, never debated with him, never said, I'm not doing that, what are you nuts? And our Lord and Savior willingly gave himself. But it cost God the Father something. I want you to understand it also cost God the Son something. It cost him something. It cost Jesus the home that he had had in heaven throughout eternity. He left all of that. All of the comfort, all of the adoration, all of the, the purity and holiness of heaven, he left all of that and came to this earth so you, you and I could be saved. You see, that's why it's so foolish for anybody to think by joining a church you could get to heaven. Or by putting some money in an offering plate you could buy your way to heaven. Or by being baptized that you could get to heaven, folks. If any of that were true, Jesus would have been a fool to leave heaven and come to this earth and suffer for us to be saved. That there is no other way except that Jesus was willing in his perfection to take upon on him the sacrifice or the suffering of our sins penalty. And there at Calvary, it cost him something. He had never known sin. The Bible says he that knew no sin became our sin. I can't hardly get over that. Listen, from the time I was a boy, nothing has ever so moved my heart as the thought of what Jesus went through at Calvary for me. And had you been the only sinner on earth, God loved you enough he would allow his son to go through that just for you. So you could be forgiven. It costs the father something. It costs his son something. We know that the Bible tells us when Jesus was on Calvary, finally the sky was darkened. And at that moment, God the Father turned from his son because he could not look upon sin. It not only cost him the agony of Calvary, it not only cost him his his home and the adoration that he'd had in heaven and all of the purity there. But I want to tell you something. It cost him his father for a, for a time there. He turned because he couldn't look upon the sin that his son had taken. Your sin and my sin. It cost him something. And I want you to understand it's cost others something to get the gospel across the world. You see, this matter of missions and this matter of getting the, the word spread so folks can get saved under every nation and every tongue and every kindred, it's always cost. It costs the Father, it costs the Son, it's cost others through, through the history. It's cost something. It cost the apostles something. You can't follow without forsaking. And every time the Lord called His apostles, He said, forsake all. And follow me. We're living in a time where folks want to listen to a Christianity that the preacher gets up and makes everybody feel good and hey, God loves you just like you are, and, and you know, everything's okay with God because He made you, you know, and you're just what you are. And I want you to know tonight that God loves you just like you are, but that doesn't mean He doesn't want you to be changed. God doesn't love our sin and God doesn't love our disobedience and God doesn't love our rebellious spirit and God doesn't love our resistance against His leading. And every Christian that has ever really surrendered to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, it cost Him something. It cost the apostles something. We read about the apostles... Matthew, the Bible, or the history records that Matthew was slain with a sword. Mark was dragged to death in Alexandria. Luke 
hung from an olive tree in, in Greece and was still preaching while he was hanging. John was boiled and then banished. Peter was crucified upside down outside of Rome. James the Greater was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from a pinnacle of the temple and he laid dying and while he was laying dying he was still preaching. Bartholomew was filleted alive and preached till he died and Andrew was crucified and he was pushing up and pulling up while he was crucified tr still trying to preach. Jude was shot through with arrows. Barnabas was stoned at Thessalonica. Thomas was run through with a lance in the East Indies and Matthias was stoned and then beheaded and Paul was beheaded by Nero. It's always cost something. And I want you to know it's cost others something to obey the Lord. I met a wonderful missionary. His name is Jerry Williams. Brother Williams is now up in, I guess, late 70s. Brother Jerry Williams came to our football camp this year and helped out some. It was a blessing. It was hard on him because of his age. Jerry Williams, he went to, to a college at the uh, Illinois State back when he was a young man, and he played football for them, and in fact, was honorable mention All-American. Jerry Williams got out of Illinois State. He became a coach. He was coaching a high school team when the, somebody presented the gospel to Jerry Williams and he trusted Christ. Man, when Jerry Williams got saved, he said, you know, I gave everything I had to playing football. How foolish it would be of me not to give everything I have to the Lord Jesus Christ and have something that will count for eternity. He began to grow in the Lord and he was at a missions conference. He got challenged as a young man, not married. Just a single young man who's coach at the high school. And he said, Dear God, here am I, send me. And Jerry Williams left. He raised support. He went to Papua New Guinea. Amazing, amazing story similar to what I shared with you this morning. Jerry Williams said, Lord, send me someplace that other people won't go. Send me someplace that other people are afraid of. And Jerry Williams went to a place in Papua New Guinea, again, a, a, a tribe nobody had ever been to. He went and waded and swam through creeks and rivers to get to these people. God sent him a wife after a couple of years from the states who also just had a heart to be a missionary. God put them together, then they served for many, many years. Now he's way up in his 70s, his wife and he are back home in the States. They want to make another trip to New Guinea, but they just don't know if their health would allow them. You see, they've probably had malaria a dozen times. They've been sick near death at least a half a dozen times. God used Jerry to go into a, a, a village where the, the, the chief of the village was a witch doctor and everybody listened to everything he had authority and power over everybody everybody feared him and God used Jerry Williams to lead that man to Christ when he got saved it had such impact he started bringing every single day he brought more to the missionary to hear the story of Jesus Christ and they began to get saved and get saved until that village had trusted Christ he got trained uh, a native pastor, he went on to another village. But I want to tell you something. It not only cost Jerry and Mrs. Williams the time away from family at celebration times of birthdays and Christmas. and It not only cost them the, the, the comfort of living in America, it cost them their health as well. But Jerry Williams will testify to you if I had 10,000 lives to live over, I wouldn't want to have lived it any other way than reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It cost others something. And I want you to know it'll cost you. It'll cost you. Ah, the preacher, you know, man, he wants us to tithe, and, you know, we got this need and that need, and then he wants us to give to missions too. It's not the preacher that wants you to just give to missions. He wants you to be obedient to the Scripture. He said, that's the heart of God. He wants you to be able to have part 
of that gift that will be given to the Lord of a new song that will be sung to praise and honor to Him from every kindred and every people and every nation. And you get to have opportunity to invest in that. But it will cost you something. The truth is, your preacher has mentioned several times this week, faith requires that which you cannot see. Brother Fennell mentioned that. It requires what you cannot see. The truth is, we have to stop and consider what are we willing for it to cost us to have part in that great gift in eternity to our Lord and Savior of more souls that bring joy and pleasure to His heart. What will it cost us? What are we willing for it to cost us? You see, the truth is, if we just give that which never alters our lifestyle, we've never made a sacrifice. You don't make a sacrifice unless it alters your lifestyle. And it should cost us something. It's a privilege to be able to give. I was preaching a revival meeting years and years ago here in Ohio. Seems like the Lord's given me the grace to help a lot of Buckeyes through the years. <laughs> don't say anything, Pastor, I'm preaching And I remember in the, in the meeting, it was a good church and well attended through the revival meeting. And I remember every night there was a, a little lady that came that just sat by herself. Very faithful. You could tell when, when you were preaching. You know, when you, you're up here preaching, it's interesting to look on the faces of people. Sometimes a little scary, but it's interesting. And, and I remember this lady, she would just light up as I was preaching. You know, they, she just loved the Word of God. You could just see it all over while you're preaching. On the final night, I was gathering everything together, getting ready to get on the road and head out. And People had come by and shook hands and made nice comments and that kind of thing. And this little lady came out. And she said, Brother Booth, you've been a blessing to me this week. It's really encouraged my heart and I want to thank you. And I said, well, God bless you. I appreciate that. And she shook my hand and you know, she gave me a Baptist handshake. It was some money in there. And I said, ma'am, you don't have to give me anything. She said, oh, yes, Brother Booth. I do have to give you something. You see, the Lord told me to. And I said, well, I, I'm appreciative of that. Thank you. And I just stuck it in my pocket. You know, I didn't look at it. And I finished packing up, and everybody was pretty much gone, and the preacher and I were standing there. And I, I said, preacher, I said, that, that little lady came out. She had something in her hand when she shook my hand and I pulled it out and there was a hundred dollar bill. And I said, preacher, that little lady gave me a hundred dollar bill. He looked at me and he said, Brother Booth, let me tell you her story. He said for 35 years she was a faithful pastor's wife. She loved the Lord. And he said just about two years ago her husband that was pastoring ran off and left her. She came to our church. She lives in a little one-room apartment. She really has nothing, Brother Booth. He said, but I guarantee you, what she gave you, if she said God told her to do it, God told her to do it. But you see, it costs you something. It's not something that God won't take care of. He promised He'll take it. In fact, you'll get more blessings than you can count out of it. But to follow the Lord and to do the Lord's will and to give in this matter of missions, it'll cost us something. And so I want to finish the missions conference by asking you, what will you allow it to cost you? What will you allow it to cost you to have part of the investment in that eternal worship of our Lord that We'll be honoring Him from every kindred and every tongue. What are you going to allow it to cost you? Your preacher said it, I said it this week. Everybody could do something. Everybody ought to have some part. You'll determine what God wants you to do and what you'll allow it to cost you. I read about a preacher that went on a missions trip. He was from Boston. And he went over to Boston with a few other people, or, or went over to um, uh, 
um, Hong Kong with some other people on a missions trip. And, and uh, they got over in Hong Kong and they spent several days there and met some missionaries and did some work there. And, and he took slides or pictures, you know, with slides back then of, uh, of everything. You know, he just took pictures all over and he was excited to get back home and share it with his people about his mission trip to Hong Kong. When he got back home, on Sunday night, he had announced, you come, we're going to show you the slide presentation from our missions trip to Hong Kong. When he got back home on Sunday night, the crowd gathered. He began to show the slides. And he showed the different places and some of the sites that they saw and, and the different people they met and, 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 and some of the missionaries that they were with and so forth. And then he got to the last slide. And the last slide, he took a picture just before they were to depart, they went to a real nice bakery in Hong Kong. They just had delicious baked goods. And they were sitting in there before they were to get on their plane and leave. They were sitting in there enjoying some wonderful baked goods. And he looked out the window, and at the window, big plate glass window of the bakery, there was a little orphan girl who was a street urchin just a little girl, and she had her face planted up against that glass looking into that bakery, watching them eat that delicious baked goods. And said her hair was kind of matted and her face was quite dirty and her clothes were pretty much shambles. And she pressed her face against that glass and she watched until she fell asleep that way with her face against the window. The pastor took the picture. He told the people about that little girl looking in there who was just a street urchin. And that was his last slide. And somebody yelled out from the congregation, Pastor, what'd you do? What'd you do, Pastor, for the little girl? And he looked and he dropped his head. He said nothing. Are you going to do nothing? To reach people across the world, it costs the Father something. It costs the Son something. It costs others in past something. If we want to have a part, it's going to cost us something. What a shame it would be to do nothing. What a privilege to do something. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this week we've had. We thank you, Lord, for a pastor who has the heart and burden and vision for world missions. And thank you for these missionaries, Lord, who surrendered to do the part you called them to do. Now, would you help us tonight, Lord, that we'd be obedient to do our part? Maybe some have already filled out cards and maybe they need to reconsider. Maybe they haven't sought your heart about it. Maybe they need to change it. Maybe some haven't turned in a card yet and they need to turn that in. Lord, every one of us should do something, Lord. We want to praise you tonight and thank you that you are willing to go through the horror of Calvary that we could be forgiven and saved. And every one of us that can take, go to that place where we trusted you as our Savior. Lord, we have a debt. We thank you and we love you. Would you help us now? To be obedient in this opportunity. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. I wonder if there's somebody here that would say, Brother Booth, be honest with you. If I died right now, I can't tell you I'm sure I'd go to heaven. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I hope so. I, I don't want to die and go to hell. I've had many, many people throughout my ministry say, You know, well, I, I think so. But I want to tell you, the Bible says you can know so. It's not because you're good or better than anybody else because all of us are sinners by nature. It's only because Jesus is willing to pay for that sin at Calvary. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's not six, seven different ways to get to heaven and everybody's just doing their best. That's a lie. That's not true. According to the Bible, Jesus said, there's only one way and it's through Him. What He did for us at Calvary. As a boy, my heart was convicted. I knew I was on my way to hell. I'd heard my dad preach about it. And I went to my daddy weeping. 
He said, what's wrong? I said, Daddy, I don't want to go to hell. I need to be saved. I've never been saved. And he opened the Bible and showed me that Jesus paid for my sin. If I'd call on him with a sincere, repentant heart and ask him to save me, he'd save me. And I called on the Lord that day and I was born again. Are you sure you're saved? Can you go to that place that you know without a doubt that you were saved? If not, if there's somebody who would say, Brother Booth, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I am concerned about it. I don't want to go to hell. If I could really be sure, according to the Bible, that I was forgiven and saved, after all that the Father and the Son did for me, I'd like to be saved. I'd like to know that I'm forgiven. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Just put it up and put it down. I won't embarrass you. I promise you that. I'd like to be your friend and pray for you. That's me. God bless you. Somebody else. I'm just not sure. I don't want to die and go to hell. I'd like to know for sure if I could, and I promise you, we can show you in the Word of God, right in the clear in the Scripture, where it says you can be sure. Not by being us, not by joining our church, by trusting Christ. He's the one that did the, the work for us. Is there somebody else? Yeah, include me, pray for me. I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure. Anybody else? I wonder how many tonight say, Brother Booth, I am saved, and I'm so thankful that I am. Again tonight, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. There's some things that I need to change. There's some things I ought to forsake. After what it cost the Father and it cost the Son, it's cost others in the past who followed the will of God. And Brother Booth, I've, I've been too much centered on self. God spoke to my heart. and Maybe there's things this week God's been dealing with your heart. Maybe you've been struggling I want to tell you, there's nobody that's ever found joy in life who's continued to fight against God. The great joy comes when you surrender and say, Lord, you love me, you designed me. Whatever you have planned for me is better than anything I could plan. And I wonder tonight if you'd say, Brother Booth is a Christian again tonight. The Spirit of God has dealt with my heart. And I know there's some things He wants different. There's some things I need to, maybe there's things you need to start doing that you haven't, haven't been doing. Maybe there's things you need to stop doing that you know he's not pleased with. Say, Brother Booth, the Spirit of God's dealing with me as a Christian. Pray for me tonight. Would you slip your hands up, Christian? God speaking to your heart. God bless you. Thank God for you. Several hands. God bless you. Anybody else, include me in the prayer, Brother Booth. Maybe somebody didn't even mention, but the Lord's dealing with you about it. Include me. Pray for me. Anybody else? God bless you. I'm glad we waited. Several others. In just a moment, we're going to stand for prayer. After we pray, the music will play. God spoke to your heart tonight. Why don't you come and find a place at the altar? Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, why don't you come and say, Dear God, give me the grace to have victory what you're dealing with my heart about. If you're not sure that you're saved, you're not sure you're going to heaven, you'll see others come. If you'll just come and let us know at the front, I want to be sure that I'm saved, forgiven on my way to heaven. I'd like to see that in the Bible. We'll have somebody trained in the Bible show you from the Bible how you could trust Christ tonight. Leave here making the most important decision you'll ever make in your life by giving your heart to Jesus Christ. Stand with me for prayer, please. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for so many that have been faithful through the, the missions conference. Thank you for speaking to our hearts time and again and, and for tender hearts, Lord, that allow you to speak to them and Lord, again tonight, there were a number of hands raised and decisions that need to be made. Help us to humble ourselves before Thee. Thank You for being such a wonderful God, such a wonderful Savior. And Lord, may we love You so much and be so grateful that we're willing to allow it to cost us something. That one day we could be in heaven with Thee, rejoicing at all of the adoration from every tongue and every kindred and every people. Help us tonight, Lord. Somebody that's not sure they're saved, going to heaven, draw them. Give them the, the, the uh, courage to just step out and come as others come. That they can see from the Bible tonight that they could be saved and leave from here with that grace and peace and assurance, the uh, uh, great peace and assurance in their hearts that they're saved and on their way to heaven. Do your work now, we pray in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart. Would you come right now? You raised your hand and I prayed for you. Now is your opportunity. Would you come? God speaking to your heart, you come. If you're not sure that you're saved, 
would you come tonight and allow us to show you from the Bible how to be saved. We have faith promise cards here at the altar. If maybe God's burdened your heart to change what you thought you were going to do and God's put on your heart to do more, you can come and change that. There's cards at the altar. Others need to come. God's speaking to your heart. Just come. Say yes to the Lord. I've been in the ministry 39 years now. I've never at one time in my whole ministry ever met somebody who regretted saying yes to the Lord. Oh, but the countless stories of those who fought God and wouldn't say yes to Him. You need to come. Would you come?